overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen, and with me today in the studio is Brian Hopkins, lead singer of Elvis Monroe. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Dude, I'm excited. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate it. Uh, I was saying this off camera that you and I have purposely not had a conversation just so we could have a conversation on camera. And I love that sense of um, discovery. You know, when you're sitting here, it's like going and having coffee with someone and learning about them. But, you know, others can be inspired by the story. So it's pretty cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a while. And I'm grateful that we were able to nail it down and get in here together today. So honestly, knowing very little about your background, but similarly, like hearing your story, I was really uh, hoping to get in here today and, and us just have a conversation. Oh, yeah. And you give me some of the background. George gave me a little bit behind the scenes oh, yeah. before, before we got started. So I, I hear that there is a lot in your background. Uh, yeah, there is. You know, I'm the lead singer of a band called Elvis Monroe. I started this with my uh, bandmate, Ben Carey, and you might know him from a band called Lifehouse. Um, you and me, Hanging By a Moment, all these huge songs. They've got, I think, 15 or 16 top 20 or top 30 hits and two massive uh, songs as well. But he's my best friend. I write all, the, all these songs with, and I get to have a life um, that I've, you know, I've dreamt of as a kid. I grew up in Oregon. I'm an ex-athlete, uh, you know, who was just searching for that thing. I've never drank or done drugs. I've never, I don't know what alcohol tastes like. I've never had a drug in my body. Really? I had a wisdom tooth, you know, my wisdom teeth pulled. And only when I found out it was Tylenol with codeine, I didn't take it. You wow. know what I'm saying? So, those kinds of things, and it's it's I'm Native American Indian, so I know that that this there well on both sides of my family, it's unfortunately alcoholism is something that is dealt with heavily, um, and I knew at the age of eight years old, uh, I'm not going to drink or do this, and I now want more for myself, um, and sports was my way out, and so I grew up in Oregon and ended up in in uh california which man we would need like five hours to get into the things that and and how i landed in this seat but um i'm giving you the abbreviated version you know like a, being an ex-athlete who got got hurt and you know you know oh there's there's already so much yeah it's I, wanna, crazy. I, wanna, I wanna start yeah, with please. that with that one you said at eight years old like you made a decision new right then what was it that was so impactful to make that lifelong decision? Um, you know, it's easy. It, it sticks out with me. Um, and that is, I had witnessed so many things. My parents were young. They had me at 16 years old. And mm -hmm. so um, my dad and mom, you know, they were kids. They were in their early 20s. And here I am, eight. And I'd already witnessed enough things where... My dad was one of the, my dad's a great guy uh, and he was young and he was always the, hey, go stay at Grandpa Rocky's house or um, Uncle Rocky's house and, um, and, and Aunt Terry's to learn discipline, to learn, you know, go with, stay with them for the summer. My cousins and stuff would all come stay with us. Yet my dad's the youngest brother in his family, but he was a functioning alcoholic. He was somebody who could was drinking heavily on the weekends and going to work, doing his job, coming home, raising four kids. But on the weekends, like if we got a new TV or something and he and my mom got into an argument, instead of putting hands on my mom or whatever, he's punching the walls or he'd break the TV or he would, I remember him fixing up this old truck and I go out into the garage to try and take the bat away from him because he's beating up the car because, you know, it, it's, it was something he dealt with. But my dad, I like, come to find out later, my dad um, dealt with things like um, he was in the military, a Marine. I wear his dog tag. You know, my dad's a Marine. And I would find him at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning drunk and crying, you know. And it's because 
in Vietnam, he was supposed to go over, and because he had me, you know, um, he didn't. They didn't send him over, and he was the platoon leader, tank driver. He, you know, and none none of his friends in his platoon came back, mm -hmm. and so he wow. held this sense of uh, survivor's remorse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know until later. Figured it out later on when I had conversations. I have a great relationship with my parents. My family is really tight. But I knew when my dad was sitting on the, on the porch and I'm reading the lyrics. My dad was a singer in a band as well. And uh, I'm making sure he's singing the right lyrics. And then he asked me to go grab him a beer. So I run to the refrigerator, grab him a beer, hand it to him. And he said, you know, that wasn't fair of me. I asked you to go, go grab me a beer. I can do it myself. And two, one day you're going to want a drink. And I, want, I don't want you to hide it from me. It's going to, that day's going to happen. And I, I need you to be safe. I need you to just be honest with me open. And I looked at him and said, I'm, I'm never drinking. You don't have to worry about that with me. And he said, why? I said, because I don't want to do this to my kids or my wife or my girlfriend or myself. And he just looked at me in awe. And I'm, and I'm like, I, you're great. I love you. But I just don't want to repeat this. And I mean, I'm eight years old. Wow. What, and, a, what and new. an insight, even at that early yeah, age. Uh, but it was just, but I'm also uh, the oldest of four. So at eight years old, I had a six-year-old brother, uh, five-year-old sister, Angel. So Cody, Angel, and Buffy. And, and uh, uh, my sister was the youngest. Buffy was three. So my job was to look out for them. And my dad did everything he could to make sure that I, was, I got all the things that I needed. Um, but I was the oldest of four. And my job was to make sure that they were safe. You know, so that, that right there, it just... And it just stuck. And George knows this. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm an athlete. Yep. And so... You can sling it. You know, that, but that, that, uh, that whole thing, I knew as a kid growing up that that was my way out. And if you're across town and people compared Athletics. you and me... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, football and baseball. Yep. And, um, and I played basketball too, but as I got older, I separated the two. And I was a quarterback and then... And then I was a pitcher and played shortstop and then first base. And it was crazy. And well, uh, well, just, just to cut in there, yeah, quarterback and pitcher, I'm, I'm catching you were also at eight years old, the protector of oh, yeah. your yeah. siblings. Like you've been a leader from a very young age. So this was some of what I was curious, like to get that background so what did that look like in sports when you separated the two high school things start getting serious? Oh yeah. Like it was, it was one of those things where I needed to be the guy in charge of winning or losing. Mm, and, okay. and I would take that responsibility that mm. rode on me. And I was okay with that, you know, because if somebody else, somebody else was leading the charge and we failed and, and that meant I failed, then now I'm going to take the responsibility. It's got to be on me. And, um, and, and baseball was, you know, it's a team sport and I, I love being a team player. I'm in a band. I don't want it to be the Brian Hopkins show. I want it to be a band. I love being the leader of the band. I'm the lead singer, songwriter. This again, it's that thing. And the thing that I was chasing and not drinking or doing drugs, I'm chasing a high that people don't have. You only see it on TV. You see it in the movies on the big screen. You go to concerts. You pay for tickets. And your night out is to go see somebody do what they do. Well, that's what I do. And so I've been chasing that my entire life. And that's, that's who I am. And that carried over. That's what I'm saying. Not drinking, doing drugs, those kinds of things. Just I was going to outdo you across town or in the next state or... 3,000 miles away, I was going to outwork you, but I was also not going to be at the parties on the weekend. I was not going to get into any trouble doing anything outside of, I needed an edge all the way around. Those were the things that, that, that was my goal as a kid. And I knew that I was pitching at, the, my dad said I had to 
throw you know every other day at a tire that he built and a mound and he taught me how to do it and by the time i'm 10 years old i'm out playing all the team i'm out playing them and they have to put me with the 12 year olds i can't even make the all-star team because i'm too young but i'm the best player and so that was me going through my my you know childhood and high school and i was a kid who i'm six three you know, and I knew everyone. I knew the the guys in the leather jackets smoking weed, you know, in the around the corner, the 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 people in the glee club and the doing the plays and those kinds of things. I knew the athletes. And but I ate by myself. I went I walked around the school by myself and I was comfortable with that. I didn't need a group of friends to to know who I was. And um and I was different. Like I was you know, clearly, yeah, clearly those, those are things like what you're describing as someone who, you know, I had a lot of potential in my youth. Mm -hmm. Athletics were central to my identity. I see that in you today. I follow you on social <laughs> media and I'm like, ah, oh, like he's out working me right now. I feel uh, bad. I got to get out of bed, <laughs> you know, and I'm seeing what you and the wife are doing, you know? So, yeah. And that's, that's what motivates me. Still that same level of competition, but at a young age, like myself looking back now, I didn't have that same drive. I wanted to play. I didn't necessarily wanted to put in the same level of work. Mm -hmm. I could go out and shoot around for hours by myself but to do it in a disciplined manner, which it sounds like you had that early on and to be able to take on that responsibility, say, listen, I want to lead. I want to be responsible mm -hmm. for us winning or losing. Yep. And likewise, at the same time, you're talking about being able to walk alone. Yeah. Like, I don't know too many people who are capable of like finding that in themselves that level of identity at such an early age. Like this was what I was really yeah. curious to hear because you know, the things that you've done are absolutely amazing. Thanks. And I'm always looking for the blueprint. Like what, right. what, what can I learn? What's it, what, what's the makeup? And that's the thing. And I, I get that. And you asked me that question before we got here and I'm like, oh, I don't know, but I know who I am, you know? And I know that that's, those are the things that I had to do to be better. An example, I remember a high school coach, um, and to this day I gave him credit. I was standing in front of 3,000 kids doing a show, and I'm like, there are, I, I did this thing, I put together a thing called the You Choose Tour. And I went to these schools, my old schools, Alaska, California, and I put together a thing sharing that, oh yeah, by the way, I'm standing here playing a song that you know that's on the radio, but, and I'm just like you, I'm, I went to this school, or I went to the school across town, or whatever, and, or I went to, I'm just like you in this Alaska school in a small town, you can have big dreams. And this is what I get to do, oh, and by the way, I've never drank or done drugs, and nobody could talk me into doing something that I didn't wanna do, because there's enough problems as a teenager that you have to deal with. Uh, you know, already. And I knew that then before social media, before all those things, when I was in school and a coach that had an influence on me, a teacher that had an influence on me. And I didn't get great grades. I got passing grades. And because I was so focused on the athletics side of stuff and being a good person. Um, and those kinds of things like resonated with me. So I'm standing in front of the school saying this, and it made me think of, a time that I'm doing, we're raising money for jerseys and I'm going for, from house to house collecting bottles and cans. This coach, clearly, he comes from a family of, of money and they own the jewelry store, all these things in town. And he's a coach and a teacher. And I'm the only one there because I went to where Rich could school and we, we were the ones at the bottom of the hill not at the top of the hill, you know, but we, I got into that school, I went to that school to, to play sports. They wanted me there. And he looks at me and said, I, I want you to go to this baseball camp. And I'm like, oh yeah? And he tells me how much it is. And he might as well said it was $10,000. It didn't matter because the amount of money was not happening. 
And I wasn't going to ask my parents for it or even put that burden on them to even think that they're letting me down. And he goes, you should go though. This is, I really want you there. And it was all the, these kids from all over the state and uh, a whole week. And I'm like, well, that's wishful thinking. I show up, uh, my mom said, there's an envelope here with your name on it and it's sealed and it's got cash and the application. And he had given me the money wow. to, to go to this camp, which would have been against all kinds of rules, but it didn't have his name on it. And I knew where it came from, you know? So I signed up for the camp and they gave out two awards, a pitching award and a hitting award. And there was 300 kids there. And I walked out with both. And neither one of them, <laughs> they, 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 you know, this is their camp, you know, pitching leader. And, and I walked out with both awards and it came back and I'm like, they only gave out two awards, 300 kids. And I got them both. And, um, so that kind of thing was, I was going to make the most out of all these things. And, um, and that's, that's who I am to today. Like I got in my car and moved from Oregon when baseball went away from me, I got hurt. I got drafted, was being drafted out of high school, went to college, got hurt in college, went to Alaska to work on just work and get away from ball. I, I don't, I don't want to jump yeah, past that please. because it's a lot of times it's those injuries yeah. that become defining moments yeah. in a negative way. Yeah. Clearly that's not the case yeah. here. So what was it that happened and, and how did you then deal with that injury? I, I got, I was pitching in the state championship of American Legion ball and, um, in a game one of a seven series and I hurt myself throwing a slider and there were 2000 plus people there, TV and everything. And I stood there crying on the mound, knew that I had the guy O2 and threw a hard slider, um, outside of the plate and on purpose. And I heard a pop and, uh, mm. and I knew I'm screwed. Like, and I tried to pitch one more time and I was in pain. And, um, and I was done for that time, but there was a coach there that in Clackamas County, this coach, um, was like, I want you as a ball player. Like, I'll give you a full ride still. And, um, and he's like, but do you think you can be able to pitch at some point? And I went, and I went to play third base for him and hit, and I was hitting 593, which is a, that's a big number, you know? And so... I'm like, uh, you know, I, I, I hope so. And so I stacked the team and he's like, well, I need an ACE pitcher. I need, I'm like, I got a guy I know I played against him. Let's find out where he's going. Can you give him a scholarship? And he'll only come if his best friend can have a scholarship, but he doesn't play sports. And so got his best friend then grabbed two other guys against, you know, that I played against in high school and stacked this team and took it to its first um, playoffs at, at this school. But I was only going there just because the Angels told me to stay in town and so they could watch me still develop. And then um, it just wasn't working out. Like I had pitched the game of my life and t turned to my dad. Um, well, actually, I, I played that summer, went to Alaska to get away from it all, just to work. I just wanted to work, make money. So I was painting ships on dry dock. I was working at a gym selling memberships and I was um, running a jackhammer on the weekends. Hustling. And the only reason why I was doing all these things was right when I got off the plane, um, these, I grabbed the newspaper and I saw these guys playing ball in the newspaper and went, these girls followed me in a car, in my taxi. And then they were like, who are you? And I said, can you give me a ride to this place? And I grabbed my glove and my cleats and cause that's what I knew. And, um, they took me there and these, these guys are like, are you a ball player? Who are you? And I said, I, I do, I play ball. And so they tried me out in a game and, um, I hit two home runs and it was fast pitch softball in Alaska, catch a can Alaska. And they're like, what are you doing here? I said, I just came to work. And they went, well, he owns this, he owns this, he owns this and what kind of work you want, what kind of pay you're looking for. And I said, I came to work. And they're like, well, we practice three days a week. We play three games a week as well. And I'm like, again, I came to work. And they're like, come work for me. You'll be on the clock. 
you can clock in when we're playing and practicing, whatever. And I'm like, okay. So I even made their all-star team. We beat Canada in the championship. And really? it was, yeah, total blast. Like, um, you know, I'm, I'm 18, nine, going on 19 years old. And then came back from Alaska and walked on a team and, um, and walked on a college team and then pitched the best game of my life and came home to my dad and said, I can't do this for a living. This hurts. Like, I know it in my heart. I'm done. This dream is over. When when you say it hurts, it physically hurt it, or it no, was... it it was like it hurt me it hurt my heart for the idea that I was giving up the only thing I knew. The only thing I knew was how to stand on that mound or how to stand at the plate and and be the guy that I wanted I wanted the ball in my hands or I wanted to be at the plate down two with bases loaded whatever i wanted to be that guy and so many moments you know i can point out oh yeah i we were down and i hit a i hit a, a double and brought everybody in and then came in and struck out the side and game was over and i won the mvp of that tournament or i you know what i'm saying like i can remember all these things and that's all i knew and it was gone and i turned to my dad and said I got to go after something else. And I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's not here. And my mom and dad, and, and um, they didn't know this about me until I did my podcast sitting in your seat. My mom watched uh, an episode and I said, uh, I jumped in my car with a little money in my pocket that I saved working for my uncle for three months. And I pulled into the Gold's Gym parking lot in North Hollywood at, at, at two in the morning. And when I woke up, I said, how much for a membership? They said 400 and some dollars for the year. I paid for that membership because I was going to give myself a year in Hollywood. And uh, I lived in that parking lot for three and a half months. And, really? Yeah. And I was like, my mom and dad didn't know. They didn't know that I went out there. I lived in the parking lot. I was, I was sleeping at night in the beginning till I tricked my way into getting a job at Jerry's Famous Deli, never waited tables in my life. Um, it was hilarious. I walk in and I asked for a job and filled out an application and, and they didn't have a way to call me. I didn't have a phone. So I just kept going back. And like the third time I went back, this woman, she's pregnant with twins and she goes, come here, I need you to see something. And she shows me my application and it's all these notes from the girls that work there. I said, give him a job, you know, <laughs> give this, you know, hire this guy. And yep. she goes, that's from the first day that I, that I walked in and they, it was just sitting on her, you know, at the table. And she's like, so I'm glad you came in. Um, I'm going to give you a job. And I didn't know what Jewish food was. <laughs> I didn't know what a matzo ball was, nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and I lied and said I had experience and I didn't. And um, I waited tables there and became like the guy and for three years. I, I was the best at it. No joke. Like I, I loved it. And my music career just, that's where it started was in that, in that space. It started in the deli. Yeah. And no, I'm not even kidding, man. Like uh, when I say that it did, it did. Um, one of my childhood friends landed a TV show called The Guys Next Door. And uh, he was a wrestler. You, on the USA team, and he get, got away from sports as well. And um, he landed a, a show, and uh, I went to go pick up his um, residual check. And the agent walks by, and, and her name was Natalie Rawson, and she said, you're not a client of mine. And I'm like, nope, no. And she's like, you an actor? And I said, no. She's like, don't go anywhere. She walks in the next room, comes out, and hands me this piece of paper, and she said, this is a monologue. You ever seen Breakfast Club? I'm like, love that movie. She's like, okay, this is the, one of the monologues from there. Can you read this for me? And she goes, I'll give you like 15, 20 minutes to come in the office. And I went, sure. I got nothing to lose. And I did. And I went in, and she's like, okay, I'm going to send you on an audition tomorrow. <laughs> And I'm like, what? <laughs> She's like, there's this woman. And I remember her name because she was so amazing. Her name is Barbara Libis. And she was an older lady back then. Um, her claim to fame was that she gave Kevin Costner his first um, job, speaking role. 
right? So he right. put his office next. He has his office on Paramount Lot. Mm -hmm. Her office is right next door. So, and he pays for her space because she made his career. So I knew this going in and I read for her and she's like, oh my gosh, how long you been studying? And I said, oh, I've never done this. Like I, I just read for Natalie yesterday for the first time. She's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, no, she goes, okay, I'm bringing you back for producers. This is what we're going to do. And my career started there and it, it started right then. And, um, as an actor and, um, and I've been on Saved by the Bells and TV shows and, and, uh, and movies of the week and uh, soap operas and stuff. So I had climbed that ladder um, in acting all the way to William Morris as my agency, which is the top. That's the biggest. Sure. And I quit because music was, when you back that up, I was doing both simultaneously and how I fell into music was insane. Like it's, it's well, you don't even believe it. But. What's curious to me is like we hit all, you know, you grown up, athletics being central yeah. but you started out with your dad yeah being in a band yeah leader of a band so clearly you've been around music your whole life like where was that from early on and because you're all the way up to like now you're getting the break where music is coming up right. but where did that start well music was a um music my dad and my mom i wrote a song called backyard family barbecue and because it was my dad and uncle, my uncle played guitar and he played a pawn shop guitar. When I say pawn shop guitar, it was his guitar, but he would pawn it for beer money, like randomly, and then get it back. You know, find a way, go shoe some horses or whatever, and then go get his guitar back. So any random day in our backyard, Tuesday, Friday, whatever, it would... Somebody would bring over some beers. My uncle would be there with, the, he'd come from 30 minutes away, 40 minutes away from Vancouver into Salem. And my dad and he would be in the backyard playing. My dad's singing, playing spoons. My uncle's playing guitar. They never get through a song because they'd start laughing, make up lyrics, and then go on to the next song. And it would just turn into a little backyard family barbecue. And the neighbors would come around and friends would come around. So I grew up around it. My mom was a big fan of 50s music and stuff. And, um, and then that bled into my brother. My brother became somebody who loved music. And because clearly he was a really great athlete and a really good football player, but he's trying to keep up with his big brother. And that, to this day, he'll say, was that was his demise. Like the kind of work he saw, well, I'm not going to work as hard as my brother to get these things. So I got to find something else and so music was his thing and um then i had an, another uncle and a cousin chasing music but my dad i remember being seven eight years old and we're at a wedding and somebody called my dad up to sing and um that was a mistake because as soon as they pulled my dad up to sing everybody started paying attention at the wedding and they, they my, my mom's having to stand side of stage and mouth the words to him. I remember this because my dad's nervous and, he, and they're playing cover songs. And, and so he's looking at my mom for the right lyrics and then until he got comfortable. And I remember this. And then the band stops. We're going to take a break. And then they come back and nobody's paying attention. So they pulled my dad up again. Everyone started paying attention. But that's what, and then come to find out, my mom's like, oh, your dad does this all the time. Bands pull up all the time to do a song because it, the whole room would light up but he's this big indian with this all this charisma and uh and so it was just one of those things that i noticed and um to this day i was just telling my girl this um i was a kid throwing a baseball in the basement against the wall and i was singing and my brother and my dad caught me and they start laughing and they went, ah, oh, Brian, just keep being pretty. Just throw that baseball, keep being pretty. And I went, okay, challenge accepted. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm the one who made a career out of it. And I'm the one who went off and played, I played the Rose Bowl. I've played, you know what I'm saying? Like I have done things and make a living 
doing music. But and how I got there is a whole nother story. But but um, so that's where the love of it came from. And they know this. They 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 both of them are so apologetic, but also uh, like you're welcome. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I remember that moment because there are defining moments in our lives that actually you go, you, you don't know it. It could be somebody walking through that door and saying something to you and I like challenging us to like our podcasts are not going to be blah, blah, blah. And you're like, what? And this will be the moment that we're like thinking of, you know, that that defines who we are. That's credibility. Yeah. That's what this is all about. Yeah. It's those defining moments. It's how certain people respond to those. Not everyone responds. That. Most people don't respond that way. You've done it in all different areas of your life. Like the patterns there are absolutely amazing. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, um, thanks man. Um, so back to the restaurant, um, and, you know, I've really not got into this. I've never sat down and, and talked about it. You know, I've talked to little nuggets, but, um, you know, my, my buddy was on a show, um, and my agents, Natalie Rawson, my brother's there. And one of our best friends from back home was, was moving to California. And when I say moving, they both showed up in the, in one car and said, where do we, where do we stand? And I'm like that, that spot right next to me. They're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And I'm like, I don't have a place. I've been living in my car. So after two days of trying to do that with them, and I, by the way, I had $7,000 I had saved. It was in my car. So it wasn't that I didn't have money. It was that I didn't have the need to run off and go pay somebody to live somewhere when I was doing just fine. I could crash on a couch if I wanted to, if I needed to sleep in the daytime or watch someone's dog or cat in the day because I worked from midnight to seven in the morning at night. So I worked at night and then the daytime, the gym was my shower where I worked out. The movie theater in the parking lot was my TV and, and AC and they got to know me there. So I buy one two fifty ticket in the daytime and sleep in the chair for three, four hours. They just leave me alone and they, they knew me. And so I couldn't do that from with my brother and my friend. So I was like, God, oh, I'll, I'll go get us an apartment. And I, I just, paid for an apartment and moved in. But so I go to a show and um, it's at Universal Amphitheater up at Universal. And, um, and it was like a Kiss FM show. It's like all these artists on this bill and my agent got us the tickets. And I get up to go to the bathroom and I literally got swarmed by a bunch of teenage and 20 something girls. Like, no joke. Security's yelling at me. Hey man, you can't, can't be doing this. I'm like, I don't know who they think I am. I have no clue what's going on, man. Like, I'm just trying to go to the bathroom. So he sends me back to my seat and I sit down and I tell my brother what just happened. And my brother's like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm, I'm serious. And we get up to leave the shows over and now it happens. And my agent's watching this. My buddies are watching this. My buddy, Dan, and my brother is standing next to me. Now my brother is yelling at the security guard because they're yelling at me for causing this jam in the lobby of all these girls and i don't know what the hell they want right so my brother takes my head and just runs me through the crowd out the door and then he goes run this way and we start running towards the buses <laughs> and a security guard's like stop stop you can't come through here and my brother's like tell them that because we're being chased like by 200 girls and but what had happened was we tried to go across the bridge first and mob mentality is when you're being chased, they just, everybody turns and starts running towards us. So now they're running across the bridge at us. Now we can't go across the bridge to get out. So we have to go left. Now we're being followed. They go over the fence. Dan goes over, Cody goes over. I go to jump over and I get grabbed. And this girl, I'm like, what do you want? And she's like, give me a hug. You better go. So I hug her and I jump the fence and we get to the other side. And all I remember is these little wooden slats. And all these girls screaming. And I'm like, this must be what the Beatles felt like. This is insane. <laughs> Our, my agent, Natalie, rolls up and she goes, get in the car. She goes, what just happened? And we're like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea what just happened. So she had called me the very next day and she said, um, 
do you play guitar, sing or anything? And I'm like, no, my dad does, my brother does, you know, cousin, uncle. I don't, I don't do music. And I didn't. And, and this is at what age? I'm 20, uh, 21, okay. 21 years old. And um, I'm like, no, I, I don't do that. And so uh, maybe five weeks goes by and I go out to Ventura County and there was a show out there and it's another radio station show. And uh, I'm in the audience and it starts to happen again. So security comes and grabs me and takes me and sticks me in a hallway. I'm standing in the hallway by myself. And I'm like, I'm going back to my seat. And they're like, no, you're not. You're a disruption to the show. And it's two shows. There's a show in the daytime and a show at nighttime. And, um, and in the daytime show, this, this was a daytime show. Um, it's about 2,200 people in this theater. And, uh, and they stick me in the hallway. And then until this guy comes, walks towards me, and he has a, a, a lanyard, like a pass, right? And uh, I, you've seen him on TV, but I've never had one put on me. And he puts it on me, and he goes, uh, do you sing? Who, who are you? I'm like, no, I, 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 don't know why, I don't know why that's going on. This, this is new, right? And he said, uh, so you an actor? I'm like, no, again, I don't know. Like, he goes, well, can you remember this? And he rattles off Rainbow Girls, a certain song, their label, where they're from. Can you remember this? And that's all I remember, like the Rainbow Girls part. And I went, why? And he goes, because this guy's bombing. And I won't tell you who it is because he's a big Vegas act now, but he was young, <laughs> he was young back then. And okay. um, they call him off the stage and, and said, give him the mic. And he, he, was, he was literally like, fuck what? you. He's like, and he just left. And he's like, I got paid. And he left. And they're like, well, now you better get this because they just lost the host. And so I grab it and I walk out on stage and there's two spotlights whoop, right on me. And I just like, yo, how's it going? And everybody starts screaming. And I'm like, my name's Brian. And then screaming. And I'm like, you yeah, having a good time? And then I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Turn off those spotlights. I can't see anyone. And I'm turning off spotlights so I can see this crowd. And in that moment, I went, Oh, this is where I need to be, but I didn't earn this. This is not something I have earned yet. And I have to find a way to be here. This is where I'm supposed to be. And I hosted the rest of that concert and I hosted the nighttime concert. And they, they couldn't even, when I tried to get to my car, I couldn't get to my car. They had to send a PA out to drive my car to the hotel, <laughs> stick me in a car with the other artists and drive me to the hotel and they said, we can't pay you. We paid so-and-so and we give you a hotel room, free food, whatever you want to drink. It's the whole fourth floor. We bought the whole fourth floor. It's one big party. And I went, wow. And so my whole goal from that moment on was how do I get here? How do I earn this? And um, I'm at Jerry's Deli and I'm waiting tables and I'm walking from the front to the back. And this guy grabs my arm and he goes, hey, What's your name? I said, Brian. He goes, you a singer? I said, no. He goes, that's funny. You've been singing, walking past me all night long. We need to talk. And his name was Alan Savori. And uh, he's a big artist. He's produced a bunch of people now. And uh, he was young at the time. And we wrote our first song together. And I ended up getting signed to a production deal with a guy named Mars Lazar, who was working on a, an album with Seal. Four Seals, first album with a guy named Trevor Horn. So those guys signed me, put me in the studio, and um, wrote three songs, and that's how I started my music career. And, uh, and I wanted more. I, I, this is who I am. This is how I am. Mm -hmm. Through the glass. I'm in a studio that I can't pay for. They're doing it all. I'm just singing and, uh, and uh, you know, doing songs that I wrote, co-wrote with them. And, and I had met Seal and, and Easy E's in the next room. You know what I'm saying? We're at this studio. And I hear them say, he's just going to be a recording artist. We, we'll record him. This guy has a great look. We can blah, 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 blah. We don't have to worry about him playing live. And I'm like, they don't know that that's where I deserve to be. That's where the universe told me, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I'm going to earn that. So that didn't fly with me that day. And I remember seeing that. And um, 
I found myself w seeing these guys playing in a park one day and walked up to them, come to find out they lived in my building, my apartment building. And um, they said, we're looking for a singer. And I said, I'll audition for you. And they're a band. And um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know who that guy was, George? Old Man Liver. Yes. Old Man Liver. Steven, who's Steven Stotts. Uh, he, my, he has a podcast here which is crazy. I brought him in as a guest and now he has a podcast and wow. he's got a whiskey and all these things, but he was this young guy in college and um, I ended up auditioning for his band and got the gig and said, see ya to this whole other thing and being a recording artist. I didn't want it. I oh, want so you, you walked away from the studio from seal from, I walked away from that, that, that production deal. I honored it. Okay. Let them do whatever they're going to do with it. Yep. But then went after this band thing. And I found myself um, on stage. Um, it was crazy. Like, I knew I was not good enough. But for some reason, the room kept was full. Like, I would go play, and the, the room was full. I ran into a guy before the pandemic. Happened in Harry. That's what he goes by. And he sees my tour bus out at NAMM. NAMM's going on right now in LA. It's a big music convention. All the musicians come from all over. And he sees my tour bus outside and he goes, this is you? I said, yeah. He goes, I know this band. I'm like, oh, I appreciate it. That's cool. I go, my first show ever was playing for you. My first time stepping on a show or a stage live was playing for you at the Ice Tie Cafe. And he's like, Wow. Yeah, I remember that. You were not good. That's what he said. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, my girl was standing there. She's like, well, it, that was rude. And he goes, but I love your band now. He goes, wow, talk about putting in the work. Mm. And, uh, and I knew it then. My brother's like, no, you weren't bad, man. Like, people wouldn't keep coming back. They saw something in you. There was something there. He just was comparing you, you know, here, and he didn't understand why... Oh, he kept booking you. I'm like, I know. I kept filling the room, but I just, I knew that I had to get better. And uh, each time, each time there was a, my my whole life is made up of. I say that my spirit animals is a turtle, because I just got pointed in a direction, and I was going around it, under it, over it, whatever. And this is this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And I'm enjoying this journey and when it when it changes and i have to pivot that's all right that's where most people quit mm. when there's a pivot that happens they they don't know how to pick it up and 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 move forward from that and things have changed acting i stopped acting to pursue music heavily i've been through multiple bands and these pivots only made me better each time. I'm playing the Rose Bowl when my bandmate was like, hey, here's a brand new song. I just wrote this. I remember it was called Shannon. And I remember the sprinklers are going off on the, on the Rose Bowl grass. And I'm like, man, I never earned it to be here as an athlete, but I'm playing it today. It's like 30,000 people that I'm getting to play to. This is incredible. And he goes, I think I'm going to quit after today this is a way to go out the label doesn't want us to if they're not going to pay for another album i'm not going to tour another year on this record and i went don't tell the guys okay but let's just enjoy today and we did and that turned into um me borrowing borrowing a guitar from a friend and writing three songs and i started this whole new thing and i ended up it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life and my whole career just took off. New pivot. New pivot. That's what I'm saying. And instead of being down and out and bummed and whatever, and even in my dressing room that same day, I had Ray Liotta I'm eating dinner with at that show. Really? No joke, man. Like a, a soccer ball comes flying over and explodes his fucking, <laughs> excuse my language, his spaghetti just goes all over him, right? Yeah. And he does that Ray Liotta laugh. And it's on me, but it's not my stage clothes. <laughs> and I'm like, he goes, anybody got a shirt? I'm like, yeah, I got a band shirt. Throw a band shirt on him. 
and um and how jay and silent bob remember that show uh sure. the clerks yeah um this was when jay was not sober he's sober now but um i remember he and his girl in my in my bathroom in the locker room which was my dressing room coming out like sliding down the wall i'm like they just shot up drugs like mm. And for me, it was like I was in a movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is weird because I don't do drugs. I've never been around it. I, I avoid those moments. And I couldn't kick out the celebrity out of my room, you know. Uh, and he just wanted to be around us because we're the band. You know what I'm saying? So he's just hanging with us thinking it's a cool thing. I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm, I don't need you here, you know, doing that. Well, normally it's the rock stars. Yes, exactly. That are, that are partying, right? Yeah. Which... I mean, throughout this, again, you made that decision at age eight. Yeah. I'm amazed that, you know, you were able to maintain that clarity, hold fast on that decision. It's not something I struggle with. Yeah. I struggle with wanting to eat a piece of cake or something <laughs> more than I do anything. You I know what it. I'm saying? Like, yep. uh, or it, those kinds of things. I don't struggle with that. That's not an issue. It's a non it's people go oh wow I'm, I'm so happy for you i'm proud of you and i'm like thanks you don't have to be it's not something that is a it's something i deal with would you say this um because i feel like a lot of successful people that find that that are willing to put in the work you know we talked about going through doing difficult things mm -hmm. most people first sign of adversity they tap that's it i'm mm -hmm. done i don't want to do this the way that you talked about living in the car for three months, like, mm -hmm. eh. yeah, like to just brush that off means that from an early age, like you got comfortable doing the difficult things, putting in the work yeah. time after time. So that just became normal for you. That's not normal for most people. But the question is this, like when it comes to addictions, most people have certain compulsions, right? Right. Those tendencies to do those things. I notice, and I'm going to speak for myself, Having that in my background, knowing that there's some family history there, my family won't acknowledge it, mm -hmm. right? They all have, it manifests itself in a, such a wide variety of ways. Food, alcohol, drugs, mm -hmm. even sex addiction, like, and everyone's like, there's nothing wrong here. I'm like, I can tell you there's something wrong because I've had these compulsions from an early age. When I got involved in drugs and alcohol, I went as far as I could with it when I was able to get sober, be removed from that, I took that same level of intensity and energy and focused on what I really wanted. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you were able to find that early on. Would you relate that? Oh yeah. You know, and the thing is, I, cause I did recognize that those were the things I recognize that I am somebody here that I would go out of my way for strangers and, and help somebody. But I know I have a temper. I know that if, if you disrespected me, my friends, my family, my sticky paws crew, whatever, I'll be the first one to put you in your place. That's who I am. And I know that at alcohol, I'm probably going to jail. Mm -hmm. And I know that. And I know that because I've had blackout moments in, in without Without that, I've had a blackout, you know, several moments where I don't remember putting a guy through the doorway. I was, you know, in these situations mm -hmm. where I didn't go look for it. It came at me because I am okay with being different and different doesn't fit the mold in most situations. My buddies are at asking me on a way to a bar you know, my brothers want to teach me how to play darts. How come you guys have so many stories? And I'm like, it's not that. It's like it finds us. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah, right. And they witnessed it happening. And I'm playing darts. And they even offered to buy the guys drinks that are calling me Geronimo and all this stuff. You know, at the, and then when they finally stepped in my face, it was done. My brother and I are like we better go before the cops get here. And the bar owner is going, no, you come back in, you're good. They're 86. Um, I, I watched this whole thing go down. We offered to buy him drinks and, you know, just to 
defuse this situation. And I know that add alcohol into that situation and I probably wouldn't have put up with the first disrespect. You know what I'm saying? So I knew this as a kid and I knew this. I saw that in, in uncles and, and aunts. And my grandmother died of cirrhosis of the liver at, mm. when I was eight. And she was in her 40s. My uncle died of it. My dad's brother, the one that played guitar. Cirrhosis, he had a bag, Colos, 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 Colos bag, bag. Yeah. carrying it. Yep. Okay. Then his two mm. sisters died of it as well. We're Native American Indian. And it runs in our family, fire water. So these kinds of things, I'm like, no. So I'm going to take that. And I know I have an addictive personality, somebody who can, you know, um, it, it's just why I put myself in those situations. Well, it sounds like you've been able to take that, those personality yep. traits and find a way to channel those and use them to your benefit. Because every time that you had to pivot, what I'm hearing is you had to put in more work. More work. Yeah. I'm doing it now. Coming out of the pandemic, I made a band called Elvis Monroe. Yep. And I, you know, I looked out and, and met one of my um, favorite, and he's my best friend, but he was in my favorite band at the time. And he left that band to do this project with me. And he was in Lifehouse at the time. And um, before that, he was in a band called Savage Garden. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, but Lifehouse, huge band and huge at the time even. And so, you know, we've, we've tackled so many things. We were so much momentum. And then the world shuts down. And it, it just, in the entertainment world, it took, it's still climbing out of it. It's not the same. Um, only the big, na big names, you know, are getting the work. And these smaller places are struggling because places don't exist. They didn't last. And there's venues that are all gone. And um, so we're, we're coming out of it. And um, it's a pivot again. But that's okay. Like, I came out of it putting out new music, writing new music. Um, I, I got this place, Sticky Paw Studios. You and I are both the same. John talks about us in a way that I'm like, I looked at you, I'm like, he doesn't have a halo. Like, the way, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> that's how he talks about you, which is incredible. And I love that. And I'm just teasing about the halo yeah. thing. But um, it's, you know, this is an extension of myself that I didn't know that I had. And to sit down and hear stories from other people to hopefully inspire somebody who's on the other end who needs to hear it mm. and needs to know that they can connect with somebody like you and I, that they see a little bit of their selves in. They're looking in a mirror when they hear these stories, when they were seeing it coming from us. And that they can relate and know that, that it's possible to do this and possible to tackle that and that you can go after the thing that everybody says can't be done. Um, and the thing is, it's, it's about the journey. It's not. It's about the journey. It's, there is no destination. It's just destinations along the journey. And it's enjoying those things. And, and knowing that we get today, you and I get to sit down. We've been talking about this for a couple of months now, and we're finally sitting down and talking. And to know that this is just, this is just part of it, you know, because you have to sit in my seat, and I got to hear your story. You know what I'm saying? So, Well, I would, I would definitely love to do that. The journey you're talking about, Hero's Journey. Yeah. Amazing podcast. Thanks, man. You're doing amazing things. I appreciate you coming in and spending the time with, with me today and sharing all of that background because I'm a guy that likes to, I like to look at those models of success and I see everything. I see who you are right. Thank you. today. And I'm, I just needed to know the background. Yeah. I'm grateful that we got a chance to do it right here because I know a lot of people are going to benefit from that. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are we running long? Okay. Are we okay? Because yeah. um, I know that what, what John, you know, what I was saving was hoping that, you know, the three of us would sit down and talk because um, what most people don't know about my, Nicole, you met my girl. Yes. And being a musician 
um, our story is like a movie, she and I. It's, it's insane. Um, you know, I, I told you, I grew up in Oregon. And I was, uh, I'm in Oregon, and I'm on tour with Daughtry, and a buddy of ours, Brett Young, is out with Lady A. And he wants to meet up at this little bar uh, where he used to do karaoke. He's like, meet me in the middle. And, um, and we had a night off, so you know we're heading that way anyway, and we take the bus and park it in the parking lot, and we end up doing karaoke, and I end up uh, watching, witnessing this. And I, I say karaoke, I don't do karaoke, and neither does he. <laughs> he just played to you know, 19,000 people, and yeah. we just played to five, and we don't need to stand there and do karaoke. I don't do it anyway. And um, so he's like, let's just have fun and do some Ice Ice Baby, some Garth Brooks, whatever, Tupac, all this stuff I barely, I didn't know any of, right? Yeah. And it was just fun. And the manager made everybody put their phones away. And, and when it was over, I witnessed a conversation between he and his girlfriend. And, um, and actually, it was, uh, it was his brother-in-law walks up to his girl and says, hey, do a shot with me. You're, you're like family. You're his someday, right? And she literally looks at Brett and says, Brett, am I your someday? And he goes, hold on, Brian. He goes, what? And she goes, am I your someday? And he goes, of course you are. And I put that conversation in my phone because that's what I do. Like I write about real things and real stuff that mm -hmm. that's my vocal diary. That's how I deal with stuff. That's how I emote. That's how uh, it's my music is honest, right? And that's, I just, that's what it's about for me. And so I witnessed this conversation and he catches me and he goes, no, 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 one day, someday. That, there's the title, now go write it. And now we have our first co-write. And I was okay with that because the guy <laughs> had the current number one at country radio. So I'm like, all right. So a couple of days later right. um, on the bus, I come up with this song called One Day, Someday. And he's playing at Route 91. And so we come back into town and we're going to meet up with him. Ben went to go play guitar for him and help him out. And uh, I bring the demo of the song, One Day, Someday, which is about this girl who I'm going to look up from my boots in a room one day and she's going to turn my life upside down. I'm going to know. I'm going to do everything I can to get her attention from the stage. I'm going to do, you know, and she's going to just be full of life and singing and dancing and whatever. And, and I know that she's my one day someday. And so I bring this song to them and he plays on Saturday and I don't, I'm like, okay, well, I don't need to go Sunday, but on Saturday, this girl walks up to me and says, Hey, are you in that band Elvis Monroe? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, can I get a picture? I'm like, sure. She goes, I took a picture with you this past summer in May. And, uh, I'm like, I remember you. And I did. I remember taking this photo with her and she shows me the photo. She goes, let's take another one. So I did. And then uh, 22,000 people there. And I'm coming from backstage. And I look to see. And there she is again. And she, I, she sees me she's looking at her. And I'm like, dang, she busted me. <laughs> so uh, the, the, what, she calls me over is what she did. And she goes, hey, um, our picture is blurry. And I'm like, here, let's take it on mine. I take the picture. And I'm like, what's your number? I'll send it to you. Right? Yep. So the next day, I wasn't going to Route 91. And I just text, are you, are you going to the show? And she's like, yeah, I'll be there. That was it. That's, that's, that's it. That was it. Um, and I happened to be watching a band, uh, uh, Kane Brown. And I'm standing there, and she walks up next to me. And she's like, hey. And I'm like, who's your friend? She's like, this is Nicole. And I'm like, oh, my echoes to Nicole's, Nicole and Nicole. And so that, um, that night, I told her, I'll be back in this area during Jason Aldean, but, you know, I'm going to grab Ben. And so, you know, this is just somebody just in passing, you know. And so Ben and I are backstage hanging out, talking with everyone. And uh, I told the owner of the concert, um, we toasted water, you know, Ben and I had water and toasted a great event. Jason Aldean's going on. We turned to Brittany, his wife, and we're like, we're going to go fanboy out. We're going to go in the front 
and watch. We don't want to be back here watching this, you know? No one knows that it's not that cool backstage, like, you know, behind it all, but everyone wants back there. You know, everyone's just hanging out, just, you know, having a good time. And so we make our way out front and to the left. And I don't know how many songs into it, but I walk up and there's Nicole and Nicole. And they're there. And I'm like, hey, it's my echoes. And the you know, show goes on. And, and I don't know them. They're just standing in front of me and Ben's standing next to me. And then we hear what sounds like firecrackers. It's doing this thing. And I'm like looking up at the speakers, looking around. Um, what's crazy though is we're walking out and we were taking pictures with fans. And when we get out front, this guy's yelling, Elvis, Elvis, can I get a picture? And I was like, sure. And Ben asked if he could put his hat on. And we take this photo and Ben puts on his black cowboy hat. And he's like, we saw you with Jake Owen uh, in Alaska. I'm like, oh, they're Alaskan. Oh, cool. Take a picture with them. They walk about 15 feet directly behind us. And um, so, but all this craziness starts to go on and people are rustling. And then all of a sudden I see two people just go down right in front of us. And I look over my shoulder and there is a girl going right over the top of another person. And Ben grabs my arm and he says, run. And so I turn and I run like, two, three steps, and I look back, and the two girls standing in front of me are frozen. And now there's thousands of people just running this direction. And this all, to me, I can talk about this like this because it feels like a movie scene, and I didn't live it. Because mm. I can talk about it like this. It's the weirdest thing. Nicole can't talk about it. Nicole... It's she can't deal. So yeah. I had stopped, reached out, grabbed her hand and said, stay with me. I'll get you out. And what we didn't know was the music had stopped and you're hearing, sp, 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 right? And, you, and Ben had got hit in the arm and the kid that I took a photo with, I didn't know this till later, but he was shot and killed instantly. Mm. And, um, so I, I it, no joke, being an athlete and, and a, it was like, and I said this a, hundreds of times, it was like the game slowed down. The moment I had purpose, the moment I went, I'll get you out, stay with me, they locked in. They, our hands didn't get pulled apart. There were thousands of people running and no one ran through us, yet they were running over the top of everybody. Everyone, you look and people are running over the top of people on the ground, knocking people down, running through them. But you can't fault them because they're scared. People are scared, right? Sure. But it, everything slowed down for me. So I, I, they're going this way, which uh, when I turned, Ben was gone. And he was on the ground. Apparently, he had been knocked down. And then when he got up, I was gone. So he went with the crowd and I went the opposite way. I went the way we came out. We came from backstage and I look and there's no security guard there. They had left and I'm weaving through and I get to the doorway and I stopped them and I cleared the corner to make sure that we weren't running into gunfire or whatever. And then I said, go. And we start running. Now, this is a fence. Here's 22,000 people on that side, and here's hundreds on this side. So I just took us on this side of the fence. And you can, here's a stage, and you can hear it hitting the stage. You can hear it splatting on the, on the pavement, tinging off the staging, thousands of people screaming. It was chaotic. And I'm running in boots and I'm having like this out of body experience looking down and I keep telling them, stay with me, stay with me, look at me, look at me, I'm going to get you out. And we're running and I come up around a corner because I'm taking us to the artist's entrance. That's where I think is in the back corner. But I, what I didn't know is I came around the corner, the fence line started to bow back. So now I have to run back towards where all this feels like it's coming from. Yep. And so 
we hit that corner and you hear just people screaming. And what I didn't know was people were following me. So not only, they stayed with me. Whatever I was doing, they were doing. Mm. And, and I didn't know this. I just, my focus was the, the two. And then I see the fence and it's about as tall as these walls. And I know that I could hit that fence and get over, but I don't know about if fi I can, About 15 feet. Yeah, I don't know if okay. I can get them over. And somebody yells, get in here. And they open up a back of a truck, right? And, and there's a ramp, you know, that goes into a truck, you know, like when you're loading a U-Haul truck sure. or something. And there's a ramp. So I start lifting, I lift the two girls in and I just start lifting people into this truck. And you're hearing gunfire, screaming. Um, I, there was a couple who said they followed me and instead of me lifting him in, they hid behind the tire so that way they could see what was coming. And I didn't know, I, I get inside and I see a familiar face. I see somebody I know and I look at him and I'm like, we're gonna be okay. And he's like, I'm not gonna be okay. And I'm like, we're gonna be okay. And there's a guy screaming bloody murdy and he's pounding on the walls. And he's like, a, he's blacked out drunk. Mm. So, and he's screaming ISIS this and all these things. And I'm trying to calm him down and his girlfriend is crying and screaming. And the other Nicole Yorba looks at her and said, what's your, what's your name? How old are you? Where are you from? She's asking her questions to get her to be quiet and calm down. Mm -hmm. And 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 nicole rafino is just sitting there looking at me like what are we doing and i'm standing and i go to the door and i open the door and you hear gunfire so i shut it and everybody starts to panic and i'm like everybody stay down everybody be quiet and i go to grab my phone and i'm go to make a video for my parents and i'm 10 seconds into this and the guy throws rock fingers in my video. So I'm like, fuck this. And I throw my phone, I'm not dying in here. And I put my phone in my pocket and I grab him and I said, is that your girlfriend? And he said, yes. And I said, do you think it's fair that these two girls are taking care of, or this girl is taking care of your girlfriend? And she jumps up and she goes, hey asshole, take care of your girlfriend. And I'm like, everybody just stay down. And, and they're like, pulled me down. Cause I'm standing, I'm telling everybody to stay down. And I'm like, you know, and, and, and just like, I don't want to die in here. Cause it's, it just, that's the way it felt. And so I go to the door, someone had already started to open the door and there was a break in the fire and somebody had taken the ramp that was on the back of the truck and put it on the fence. And right when the door opened, the one guy hits the hits the thing and goes over and I'm like, I jump out and I said, we, somebody's got to stand on the other side and catch the women. And, uh, I started lift that my friend out, this guy I knew and his girl and they were gone. And then I just started lifting people out and, and I, I grabbed Nicole and Nicole first. They followed me. And when I turned, I'm lifting people out of the truck. They're putting people over the wall. So they're right there, and they had this bigger girl putting her over the wall together, and I go and I push her, get over, and somebody, and I, I picture him like he was a tall Asian guy. He stood there for a little bit, holding people, and then he took off, which mm. it's okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he stood there helping, uh, helping people already. This was my choice that th this was going on. And, and it was methodical. It was weird. It was the weirdest thing. Like I was moving through it thinking I'm going to keep them calm. I know what I saw in the video. I'm like trying not to panic my parents. This is what it could be. This is what, you know, whatever. And I'm going to tell them this is where I'm at. And I turned it off. What I didn't know is my phone started to record again in my pocket and it can hear all this chaos. And so when I, I, I remember hearing the girl scream, I can't go, the screaming girl, I can't get over the wall, I broke my back, I just had surgery. And her boyfriend's like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'll go first, I'll catch you. And then I remember later, I didn't lift them over. And I said, what happened? And here's what happened, it was, I'm trying to get Nicole uh, Rafino over, she slides back, 
two times. I'm like, this is not happening. I grab her by the waist. I grab Nicole's uh, the uh, Yorba's hand and I start to run to the right and I hear a police officer or a voice yell this way, this way, run towards Hooters. And he runs towards gunfire. And it, I caught it on my phone, but nobody else remembers him. I hear, I'm like, do you remember? No one remembers. They just were so focused on what I told them we're going to do. So I'm like, okay, we're going this way. And we start to go. And here's where I have nightmares about this randomly because I ran past people on the ground. And I don't know their condition. I don't know what condition they were in as I'm running. But my focus was I made you a promise. I made Nicole and Nicole a promise. I'm going to get you out. And I can't. I'm holding them and look at me. And they stop. Rafino stops crying and starts to call her dad. Stops running. And I'm like, we have to keep moving. Let's go. Let's go. And we're running past people on the ground. And we get to the opening of a gate and the gate had been pushed down and there was a guy with no shirt on and he'd been shot in the sternum and he was gone. But his buddy is crying on top of him, trying to breathe life into him. And they, Rafino was like now in pure panic mode and Yorba's trying to calm her down. She grabs the phone. There's been an incident. Meet us at the Hooters, hangs up the phone. And I said, run into, run into the dark. And what I didn't know was the couple, they were holding Yorba's hand in each other's hand, and there was an older lady holding their hand, mm -hmm. and I led them out by foot. The, the older lady took off to the right, and the couple took off to the left, and I told them to run into the dark because I, in my head, why, is he gonna, why are they going to go after a few of us when and everyone's going in the same direction? So... Um, and we get across the street, and they don't remember this. There's a car parked in the middle of the street, and there's a guy shot in the passenger seat, and there's about seven or eight people hiding behind it. And that guy was clearly gone in the passenger seat, yet there were people hiding, you know, hiding behind the car looking up. And I ran them across a, uh, the parking lot until I saw uh, an iron fence and I'm like, I can't, and there's no way I can get them over this iron fence. And two guys run up and they pull it back and I crawled through, pulled it back. And now all these people started to follow us. And then I got them to Hooters and um, we get to Hooters, get inside. And now because of what I do and, and, and that kind of thing, it's like a familiar face. People start running to me and they're like covered in blood and mud and running towards me for help. And so I gather all these people and I'm like, okay, around a machine. And I said, okay, who has phones and who knows phone numbers? Like, cause it's an all day festival. People's phones are dead. It's, you know, the, the people don't have their phones. Mm -hmm. People are separated from people. There's a girl running up to me crying, going, Brian, can't find my sister. And I'm like, just stay with me. Do you know her number? Let's, here's my phone. Here's, you know, call, you know, so we're doing this. And all of a sudden somebody yells, there's a, there's a gunman or whatever it was. And then hundreds of people in the Hooters casino floor start running towards us. And I'm like, okay, this way. And I pull everyone down a hallway through a doorway that says staff only. And it's a kitchen. And I stick them by the back door and hide them by the back door. And there's an off duty police officer who's, he's drunk, but he's like, I'm a police officer. He was at the concert. He goes, I got this door, you get the back door. So I'm hanging by the back door and I have them quiet until it was cleared. And then as soon as it was cleared, um, her, uh, Nicole's, uh, Rafino's parents showed up. Like be from that call, they raced there. He's ex CSI and he got his ass there. Wow. They said, can we take you? I said, no, there's people that are counting on me. I don't know them. I knew one person, but I, I got to get them out of here. And so he took his daughter and, and Nicole Yorba and they left. And I went back to this group and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Because they're saying, you know, there's a bombing over here. There's all this chaos in all the casinos. And um, 
I had said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to walk towards a parallel with the, um, the, uh, airport. It's dark. It's pitch dark. The airport is dark. The roads are dark. It's all blacked out. And I said, we're going to walk until we get to a point and we'll have somebody pick us up. So we walked about two miles along the airport line, holding hands. And there's about 13 of us and, um, all strangers, you know, and I'm walking them and I get them to a, uh, grocery store parking lot and somebody pulls in with a truck and everyone loads in and I'm dead silent. Like they take us to a house. Um, Ben had got separated from me. He was running and he said he was weaving, running. He even called me when I was inside and I'm like, run, I'm okay. Just, I'll get out, just run. And I hung up. I was like, I love you. And I hung up. And so he calls me, he goes, are you okay? I said, yeah, my phone is almost dead. He goes, go live on Facebook and let everybody know we're okay because that's the only way anyone's gonna know. And so I go live and I guess that live version, I look white as a ghost. I'm like almost gonna cry because now I'm hearing on the news what's going on here on the TV. There's all these people. One of the guys that I walked got in an Uber and went to the hospital because his best friend was shot. His girlfriend calls him, he was separated. And so he took off. And then I get home to my house. Uh, someone um, gave me a ride and my parents, I, I had my parents live with me seven, eight months out of the year because I'm at the point where at that time, you know, you take for granted that your parents are gonna be around forever. And I'm like, no, come walk red carpets with me. Come do these things that I've earned. Come, come to these shows, you know, come be on stage in front of thousands of people playing the spoons. Come share this with me because it, it doesn't mean anything unless we can do it together. So I have my parents with me my dad comes walking out. My home phone's ringing, which I forgot I even had. My phone's ringing, my mom's phone's ringing. And it's all these news people from all over the world CNN, Fox, HBO, it's all these people. And CNN had called, I'm talking to them. They asked me if I had a video. I said, I have like a 12 second video. It looks like I'll send it to you. I'm telling my dad, who's a Marine, sitting across from me. And it's this, I remember this because it's so surreal. There's my video and my voice is on CNN. I'm not paying attention to it. My dad's not paying attention to it, but it's happening here. The phones are ringing and my dad asked me, what happened? I'm trying to explain it to him. When I get done, he goes, were you scared? And I'm like, no. And I wasn't scared until right then. At that moment, I realized I'm not Captain America. Like I had a Captain America shirt on, but who who do I think I was? Because I was moving methodically and I wasn't scared. Until that moment, I started crying and I started shaking because I could be one of these people that, you know, my parents could be dealing with another side of this right now. And that's how, and then it just like, it was, it was crazy. So dealing with, with that, like that's, I didn't go to bed. That concert was in the daytime. I didn't go to bed till Tuesday because at my doorstep was Channel 7 LA, then HBO, CNN, uh, every news state, they were fighting to who got there first. And then they started taking me to places. I didn't go to bed until my last interview with Ellen's producers at seven o'clock on Tuesday. And on that Tuesday, they had put Nicole and I together for the first time, which we thought was stupid. Somebody saw me doing an interview. And this was weird because I, on like the first 24 hours going into it, I'm uh, walking through, I needed some water. And this big guy gets up from a blackjack table and goes, hey, you're the guy from TV. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you did good. And he goes to shake my hand and I start crying and I go to give him a hug and he, I'm like, I'm sorry. And he goes, no, don't be sorry. Don't, and, and I'm like, 
trying to gather myself, feeling embarrassed, whatever. And he's like, you're fine. I walk outside and this, this Indian lady with a cane sees me and she goes, hey, you're the guy from TV. I'm proud of you. And I started crying and I'm like, I can't do this. Like, and I ran across the street and news crews are following me across the street. And I'm trying to get to, you know, uh, to just out of there. I needed, I promised certain people I would do their things and I was trying to get everybody to do it at the same time, but they wouldn't. And um, so it's, it was taking its toll, but talking about it was sure. helping. It was helping me, you know, talking about it. Cause it kept saying it's positive. What you did was positive. People need to hear this. It's all scary. It's awful. They need to hear this story. So I'm like, okay, okay. And then what, the one time, one guy on the radio, I remember this, he was Mac on the radio, iHeartRadio. Uh, and he asked me, are you doing okay? And phew, couldn't talk, was crying. No one had asked me that in, in days. And cause it was just one after the other. Mm. And uh, so, you know, flash forward, I, I, they put Nicole and I together, which I thought was stupid at this French television uh, crew asked me if, uh, if I wanted water and food and I can go sit in their car and hide from everyone. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I get a text and it's Nicole. And uh, I'm like, hey, whatever happened to that couple? And I'm, she says, I don't know, ask, well, I'll ask Yorba and they told me. So I did get them out because it bothered me that I didn't get somebody out it, that was eating me up. And then mm. they told me that I did. And then uh, it was it was the wildest thing because that crew heard me. They're like, is that one of your echoes? I'm like, yeah. They're like, can we go meet her? Have you guys seen each other since the shooting? And I said, no. We how, thought, many, how many days later is it? This is Tuesday at about 5 o'clock. Okay. And so we go over. So it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Sunday mm -hmm. it happens. So Tuesday we roll over and we thought it was, is, I thought it was silly. And then all of a sudden she comes walking up and both of us are in tears and I'm holding her hand like I knew her. And I'm talking with them and CNN is shooting over the shoulder, stealing it as well. And, um, meaning like grabbing it as well. And, um, because she only did like one interview. They discovered her from the video. They found her. I didn't know her name. I didn't know. I only knew her name was Nicole. And so it's news people and they, they were able to find her at home. And um, she's not somebody who, you know, is used to this kind sure. of thing. So this is how we dealt with it. The days went on and, and she and I, I was there for her and she was there for me. And, um, and over time... Uh, we even went to like this, like uh, on the 5th, 5th of October, I played a show because I needed to be back on stage and they were doing a fundraiser at Red Rock and Brian Lindsay, George, you know who Brian is. Oh, Brian puts, guy. Brian put on this show with Ben Otherwise and um, I can't remember the other band um, who's blown up since. They were the opening band and now they're, they're huge. Um, and I played this, I wrote this song and I rewrote it called the fight and i wrote it for the city and it's like an anthem and so i got to meet nicole's parents proper and um they came to the show and i pulled nicole on stage and my mom stood there looking at this moment and went there's something more to this moment right now because you're grabbing her hand is like normal and i'm like yeah i grabbed her hand during the chaos and I'm singing this song and I'm singing it to her and there's lyrics to her in the song. And it's on Inside Edition the next day and all these TV shows. And then on the sick, that night, actually, my mom, I have to call 911 because my mom had an anxiety attack. She thought she had a heart attack, but it was anxiety from everyone coming up to her going, your son, your son, what happened, wow. all this stuff. So I'm calling 911. I'm sitting next to my mom in the hospital room and then I have to go to LA to do a show, a fundraiser in California. And so my mom is okay. I put her back, get her back home. And my dad was in Oregon working for my, helping my brother on something. And I'm driving to LA and 
and uh, DJ Silver, who is Jason Aldean's best friend, and he was the act on right before Jason, calls and says, hey, I'm trying to find Brian um, to Ben. And Ben goes, he's sitting next to me asleep. Because I've been up all night with my mom in the hospital. Okay, and uh, I literally uh, hear his voice, and he said, my mother-in-law wants to talk to you. And I went, okay. And he gets his mother-in-law on, and she said, I followed you. You put me in the refrigerator and then you led me out by foot. And I, and I start crying and she's crying and he's like, you, you saved my mother-in-law. Thank you. And, um, and he was there, but he was hidden in, in a whole nother, you know, under, under a bus or something. And, um, so I get to the show and I'm like, oh, there's news, cr news truck there. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm not ready to do this. Like, I'm dealing with my mom, dealing with, you know, all this stuff. And uh, they, the news crew um, was interviewing these three girls. And I'm like, okay, we're good. Two of those girls come running up to me, and they're in tears, and they tell me what I did for them. Mm -hmm. And that Nicole and Nicole put them over the wall while I, would, I led them into the the truck and lifted him in and then was keeping him calm and then was getting people out and they put Nicole and Nicole helped them over the wall and so people started coming out of you know out of this stuff and so through this Nicole and I learned to you know deal with this gritability of like what we went through you know what I'm saying and she um it, it was crazy because I brought a song to it I wrote a song then I wrote a song about that night called um, You Have My Word, which was to her saying, you know, that you, in, the mo in that moment, as long, as long as I'm holding your hand, you have my word. And then um, she almost died of viral meningitis in November, a month later. Oh my and God. And she calls, her parents call me and say, hey, um, she, she's asking for you. I'm like, she's asking for me. And they're like, yeah. And she doesn't remember this. And I went to the hospital and was holding her hand by her bed until the doctor said I couldn't be there. And then um, flash forward, uh, I'm going out on tour with Three Doors Down and I tell the bus driver, hey, um, here's, I forgot something at the grocery store while everybody's packing up. And I didn't. I raced to her house, knocked at her door and said, we've been through this. You almost died. We've, you've been through this. We went through this together. We've been helping each other. We talk every morning. But I know somebody's going to come into your life. Swoop, just, you know, swoop you off your feet. But that person has me to answer to now. Because we've been w through way too much together. And there's something about us. And now he has me to answer to. So just know that, you know, he's got your parents and now he's got me. And I left on tour. And then um, she ended up surprising me on the tour in the middle of it, came out and I'm like, whoa. And then at the end of it, I flew her out for the last um, two days on the tour. And it was the greatest day of my life. The bus driver drove through the snow and she gets off the shuttle bus in the snow, parked my bus, it's out front and the, everybody's at the front of the bus at 7 a.m. watching and nobody <laughs> videoed, nobody videoed. And she said, I love you. And we've been together ever since. And that was October, I mean, February 10th. Um, so it's been five years February for us. And we've been together and it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And it came out of something so awful. And, I, and how I deal with things is write about them. And I wrote this song. What, in that time that I was on the bus, I wrote two, three more songs. So she could see how I was feeling. And I could see, and she was writing poetry back to me. Mm. So I could see how she was feeling, like at least struggling with these things. And then I finally went for it and I wrote this song called Fallen For You Bad. And, um, and that was it. And uh, so it was a six song stretch between bringing One Day Someday to Fallen For You Bad and then, you know, us being together. So it's pretty insane. And we, there's so much more uh, to it. And, but yeah, it was pretty nuts. Well, I, I'm definitely looking forward to the rest of the story yeah. and to see what's next for you. Thanks, man. Hero's journey. I mean, truly, truly remarkable. I didn't know if you were going to go into all that today. 
man, I am so grateful that you gave me the entire story. You gave me the background. Everybody got a chance to hear that. What you did is truly, truly heroic, amazing. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry I talk so much, but <laughs> bro, like that's what we were here for. Yeah, I wanted to hear your story. Man. I understand, but inspiring. I appreciate that. It means a lot, and um, your story is just as inspiring. And and you deserve to be in that seat. You are somebody who needs to, people need to know your story, and people need to know what you can and and what you what you can do and then what you will do and it's fun to watch that and to get to know you now and to see that and 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 be able to witness the things that you've done i mean i know what you just told me you did in washington and those kinds of things you're gonna you're gonna leave your mark and that's what we're here to do you know most, what i'm saying most definitely that's what it's all about hero's journey gritability we're both looking to leave, leave a mark, leave a positive, lasting legacy uh, for all those difficult things that we've gone through and to get to the other side, ideally to inspire other people to act in the same way, to, to demonstrate that same courage. Uh, thank you for coming in, for thank sharing this Thank you for story. having me, man. Man, thank I'm, you. I'm grateful that we got to spend this time yeah. together and I'm looking forward to us spending more time together outside of here. So it's been another incredible episode, Gritability power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. Man, it's been a great episode. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen, with me, Brian Hopkins. Thanks man. for having me, man. Wow.